Hi again, folks, and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again, and we're here once again to talk about all things related to the world's second biggest property investment market, Japan. Our last episode, which was subtitled Decisions, Decisions, was all about the choices um, facing people in the market for ski holiday homes. It seems to have struck a chord with many of you um, based on download numbers and the messages that we've been receiving this week. So for this week's episode, we've decided to carry on with the same format, which is a recording of a business call with clients who are trying to make up their minds and make some decisions on how to approach certain topics related to the property market here in Japan. So this time we're on the phone with a couple from Singapore who are faced with all of the tip decisions that are facing first-time investors entering this arena for the very first time. So stuff we've discussed here in the past on many occasions, buildings versus condo units, High yield second tier towns versus first tier metropolitan centers with slightly lower yields, um, even north versus south, cash versus financing, etc. etc. So, again, you'll probably hear us bring up many of the topics that we were already discussing here on the podcast over the last couple of years. But I think it's a really good chance to see how these topics all tie together and also how all of these big and small decisions can dictate the performance of our investment portfolios over time. So some of these things may run counterintuitive to what many of us take for granted in our countries of origin. So worth noting again as well, just to ensure that we are aware of the differences between Japan and other property markets around the world. So here it is, a recording of a business call with a client from Singapore about to enter the Japanese real estate property investment arena for the very first time. Enjoy and see you on the other side. I think this is the first time we are looking into to Japan. And I've done some reading and, um, you know, uh, based on what I've read, the returns or the, 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 the you seems to be quite attractive. Um, the only thing we also understand is that, you know, probably loan is going to be an issue. Um, to a point. I mean, there are some solutions available depending on what you're buying, but it's really more a matter of whether it's... Um, it's going to be worth it. So depending on the portfolio size that you have got planned, you might have to set up a Japanese or Hong Kong company for that purpose. Uh-huh. And that comes with setup costs and monthly upkeep costs, and it changes your tax scenarios a little bit as well. So it really depends on uh, what sort of properties and what kind of uh, budget you're talking about. Right. I guess, I guess it's a chicken and egg thing. It's like, you know, if... If it is without load, then is something comfortable, then, you know, it will probably be something like a couple of hundred thousand only. But if, if we can get loan, then, you know, we can look at something much bigger. You, you know what I'm trying to say? So, yeah. yeah. So, because if I look at some of, of the offerings, you know, even uh, in, in whatever U.S. term or Singapore term, you know, a couple of hundred thousand, we can get something quite easily but yeah that's correct so, so your cash yeah. so your cash capital outlay is a few hundred thousand dollars and if you're getting financing then depending on what the loan to value ratio is you might go up to um i guess loans are usually up to 75 percent so you might get something up to say one million roughly is that about right yeah 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 one million yeah yeah we are comfortable with uh 60 40 sort of uh arrangement even anyway Okay. Okay. Well, let's let's discuss your other criteria first and then we'll get back to the loan issue and see if that satisfies their criteria as well. Um, other criteria, probably, you know, things that are easy to rent out, which I suppose uh, transportation is important, you know. I mean, we've been to Japan a couple of times, so we have been you know, as near as possible to the train station. Um what else? We're talking only about Tokyo, right? Um, well, it, it's it com- could be, yeah. completely up to you. Yeah. Yields yields and, are quite low in Tokyo. Major major Yeah. So if we're if we're focusing, let's say if we're focusing on major uh, commercial centers and places that are growing population wise, um, that would be Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, Nagoya, and Fukuoka mainly. Right. 
Um, there are some other smaller cities that are regional centers and have got good industries and good commercial profiles like um, Kumamoto and some of the satellite cities around Tokyo and Osaka. So places like uh, Kobe, Kawasaki, uh, Chiba City, um, Saitama. Um, but these places are usually characterized with less potential growth. So if the economy does well in Japan, the first tier cities that we've mentioned, so Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, Nagoya, Fukuoka, they all stand to grow if Japan's economy does well. Whereas with the other places, we can get high yields there, but that's mainly because they haven't grown in price or they haven't grown much in price. The price hasn't moved that much. That's Not much. So uh, first of all, well, first thing, sir, talking about rental income, so rental income in Japan hasn't grown significantly at all over the course of the last uh, decade or two decades. It's actually, since the bubble burst in the early 90s, rent have actually, rents have actually dropped. And since 2012 or so, when things started improving again, um, the rents have been, aside from very central Tokyo and Osaka and Fukuoka, rents have been pretty stagnant. So they might have risen slightly, but not nearly as much as property prices. Right. Okay. So, so the yield has been compressing. That's right. So the, the reason for that is mainly a trickle down effect that hasn't been happening. So economically, on the macro level, things have improved or at least look like they're improving. That's, you know, that's a cause for endless debate, but that hasn't trickled down to salaries. And because, uh -huh. because salaries haven't improved and there have actually been two consumption tax hikes, um, cost of living uh, has also been um, not, I mean, cost of living has been growing and salaries haven't been growing, which means that we can't really raise rents anywhere. Right, right. And that's the reason that you see the places that have done well as far as property prices are concerned, which is Tokyo and Osaka mainly, and then next in line, Kyoto, Nagoya, and Fukuoka. Uh, those places uh, have had their yields compressed. So in Tokyo and Osaka, it's gotten pretty close to uh, pre-bubble days. I mean, yields are very low and prices are quite high. Nagoya, Kyoto, and Osaka, uh, Nagoya, Kyoto, and Fukuoka still have room to grow price-wise. Right. And therefore, yields there are still relatively higher compared to Tokyo and Osaka. So those places are not, not near bubble uh, terms, uh, probably won't be, um, but still less than what they were before. So in Nagoya and Fukuoka, could have, for example, we could have gotten, say, 11, 12 net pre-tax up to about three, four years ago. These days, if we get seven or eight, we're very happy. Right. And in so Tokyo, now it's about seven and eight. Okay. Best case scenario. So in Tokyo and Osaka, the best case scenario is usually about four or five. Mm -hmm. And okay. in those other cities, maybe seven or eight if we're lucky. And that's just so we're on the same page. That's net pre-tax. So including all of your purchase and all of the known running monthly costs, but not including um, annual taxes and not including anything that we can't predict in advance, like vacancies or maintenance and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the net the net will be something, again, down to maybe another two points down or two percent yeah down. i mean again that really depends on the size of your portfolio and whether you uh, need to hire an accountant services and also whether you've purchased relatively older or newer buildings which require more or less maintenance so it could go down anywhere i'd say from a further one to three percent if you want to look at net net right so if you're talking about a few hundred thousands dollars and you're looking for the highest yield possible, um, you're probably, I'm guessing, looking at individual units and not um, entire buildings because with entire buildings, the yield does tend to be a bit lower. Mm -hmm. um, and also if you're purchasing cash, we haven't talked about the loan yet, but if you're purchasing cash, then you really don't want to be purchasing any building that costs less than, say, $400,000 because these would be either very old or in out-of-the-way places. Right. So if you're talking about a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, you're probably better off buying individual units. Individual units, I see. Yes. Okay. You can go for houses if you want, but houses carry a lot of uh, maintenance costs compared with uh, condo units. So again, it's up to you. Mm, understand. Individual units, yeah. I guess, yeah, if we 
if you are not looking into a million or so, you can buy a building with a few units. Yeah. Uh, you can. I mean, buildings in good locations that are not too old would usually start about maybe lowest possible would be 350,000. Like, for example, right. uh, we've got a few customers who have purchased in Fukuoka in quite good locations and, you know, buildings that have built, say, in the last 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And these do start, if we're talking about a four, six, eight unit block, these do start at about three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. So small residential buildings... Um, Maybe with some of them with, you know, a shop or an office at the ground level sort of thing. Right, right. So actually, um, in your opinion, is it good to buy and build and hold a building like four to eight units or buy units all over the places? Well, there are advantages and disadvantages. The view, you know? yep. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. I guess to make a recommendation, we'd need to know... Are you invested in any other types of properties in any other places in the world? Or what, what's your portfolio, investment portfolio look like at the moment? Uh, Singapore. Uh, anywhere. Um, Singapore and um, New Zealand, where we are now. <laughs> so that's very low yield, I'm guessing, but capital growth has been good, yeah? Yeah, Singapore. Singapore, capital growth has been good. You is very compressed. New Zealand too. Now the U is very compressed. Yeah, but when we when we first came in, yeah, the U were not so bad. Yeah. So that means your property right price, now. your property price have also gone up. Yes. Yep. They have. They have gone up a bit. Yeah. Okay. So, but but why we started to look into Japan is that you know my husband works now with a Japanese company, so he's gone to Japan more often, and suddenly it dawned on us that. The U were fantastic. Probably we should have gone in much earlier, but yeah, it's just we just saw. Well, if the you're aiming, looks very attractive. Yeah. Well, if your main criteria is the highest possible yield or cash flow, um, yeah. and you've got investments in other places that are more capital growth oriented, like New Zealand and Singapore. Um, then individual units are probably better in the sense that they will generate a higher yield. Uh, the, right. dis the disadvantages are, um, well, first and foremost, uh, they don't stand to grow as much as an entire building stands to grow simply because the, they come with a tiny land parcel for each unit and not a, a big one like a building. Right. At one, at what gains in value is basically the land. It's not going to be the structures. So right. the larger the land parcel, the more of a potential capital growth you've got. So when you're buying individual units, they do grow in price, but they don't grow as sharply as buildings in the same location. Understand, understand. And the other disadvantage is, is that they're less flexible with use. So you're dependent on uh, owner co-op uh, rule books and building management rules and bylaws. So, for example, some buildings will not allow uh, to use units as an office. So that limits your tenant base a little bit. You can only go residential. Um, most, almost 100% of the uh, units, uh, of the condo units in Japan, the building will not allow uh, short-term use, like Airbnb type. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you own the entire structure, you pretty much set the rules. I mean, you still have to comply with government regulations, but the, there's nobody else telling you what to do with your particular units in that building. Understand, understand. And the advantages are... Um, a, that there's less, usually less maintenance and unexpected expenses incurred because your monthly fees usually cover all structural expenses and all communal areas. Mm. Whereas if you own the entire building, everything's on you. So something happens to the exterior, you need to find money of, out of your own pocket to pay for it. Um, the other advantage, I guess, is that if you divide your capital between, uh, you know, a larger amount of cheaper properties, then you just get more diversity and hedging, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about commercial? My husband was just asking, how about commercial? Um, commercial in the sense of commercial buildings, or are we talking about offices and shops and restaurants and bars or logistics? Yeah. I mean, 
commercials usually start at a slightly higher price tag. So you could find maybe a shop or a restaurant or a bar, that sort of thing within that budget. But if you're looking at an entire building, that will usually be more than $100,000 or $200,000. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. And then... Uh, no, I'm just thinking more on the shops and uh, those things. But I'm not sure whether, you know, um, the demand is there. Because if you drive around Tokyo, there seems to be some... Uh, especially on the outskirts, there seems to be quite a bit of... Uh, you know, vacant sort of um, shops around. Well, uh, the res- that, 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 applies, that applies to residential as well. You just don't see it. Yeah. I mean, the further yeah, you get... Because they're upstairs, you can't see them. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the further you get from the center of the city, the more vacant properties you'll see. And, you know, as the population declines, unless something done is done to reverse that, as the population declines, the, um, the outer cities are slowly conglomerating into the bigger cities. I mean, of the cities that we've discussed, except for Fukuoka, which has got organic growth, I mean, people are actually having babies. The rest of the places uh, are only growing because there's smaller cities conglomerating into them, right? So Tokyo and the foreigners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and foreigners, unfortunately, still not that much. So, not that, so, I mean, not so many. Okay. Yeah, I mean, com- commercial wise. The advantage of commercial, I suppose, is that you can raise the rent if the economy does well a lot more than you can with residential. If it's doing well and you raise the rent, they'll want to stay in that same place and they're going to pay it. Mm, mm, um, understand. With residential, we can't do that. So as long as people's salaries haven't gone up again, we can't raise the rent. So with commercial, you've got more flexibility as far as rent is concerned. But that also means that when the economy doesn't do that well, they tend to move out and close shop and resize a lot more than residential tenants do. I mean, a residential tenant is not going to move out because the economy is not doing well, but a business might. Yep. So you got yep. more tenant turnover um, statistically. I mean, you could get lucky, you could get unlucky, but statistically, you got more tenant turnover. And if you've got a place with walk-in traffic, like a, a shop, uh, and definitely with a restaurant or a bar, then there tend to be a lot more... Um, maintenance and renovations mm. involved when a tenant does move out. Right, understand. Yeah, and yeah. also again, the price tag starts a little bit higher. I guess maybe the best mm. of both worlds is to buy a, a unit in a condo block that's designated multi-purpose. So if the building rule book allows it, that can be rented out as an office space or a residential space. Right. And then your tenant base oh, you just mean they have such a thing, multi-purpose building. Oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of uh, accountants and legal offices and uh, uh, places like us, like we also, uh, our office is in a building like that, which is about 50% residential, 50% commercial. Not commercial in the sense of, uh, I mean, there's not walk-in traffic, there's not people just coming in off the street, but people make appointments, they come into the office, That that's very doable here. Right, right. Where are you? Lo- you are in Tokyo itself, right? Fukuoka. Your, your office? Fukuoka. Oh, you are in Fukuoka? Yes. Okay, okay. We must visit Fukuoka. Yeah. Is, yeah. It, is, is it booming now? It's booming, eh? It's a fantastic city. I mean, like I said, it's one of the only places in Japan that's growing uh, organically where people are actually having babies. The population is quite young and modern here, so there's more tenant turnover, uh-huh. but we very rarely have a problem to find tenants for properties here. Um, mm. When we started, actually, most of our business was in Fukuoka City. These days, again, yields have been compressed, so anyone who's looking for more than 7 or 8% tends to go to other places like... Uh, Sapporo or Kumamoto. Mm-hmm. Um, Sapporo? That is Hokkaido. Yes. So Sapporo prices haven't right. gone out. It's a very big city, about 2 million people, or big Japan in Japan standards. Uh, prices haven't gone up significantly, so returns there can still get to 8 9%. Right. The problem with Sapporo but is... But Sapporo is, is also not a growing, but um, is... Yeah. It's not growing, no. The population is stable or in slightly declining. Um, right. And the other problem with Sapporo is because it's a winter, uh, I mean, it snows there for about half the year. And um, right. during yeah. the snowy months, for one, uh, tenants don't tend to move around as much. So if you get a vacancy uh, close to winter, you might be vacant for six, seven, eight months. Understand. And the other thing is that um, mainten- oh. maintenance costs are also higher there. So just again, because of the winter and the snow, you have to pay more for heating equipment pipes tend to uh, freeze and break down more frequently. So those high yields right. that we get at the time of purchase might not really be valid on the longer term. Right. 
understand. On the upside, it's more of an old school city with a little bit of an older population. So people don't move around as much. So tenant turnover is quite low there. And you do have a lot of places where people have been living for decades, which is something that we don't get much in Fukuoka. Right, right. So in that sense, it's stability in one way. If you have tenants there, they, they likely will stay there for yes. very long. Yes. Also, because um, they've got more room to build there, uh, properties tend to be bigger. So even, I mean, in most of the bigger cities, the highest yielding properties are usually studio or one bedroom apartments. Um, right. And they have, obviously, they, they'll have a single tenant or uh, maybe a couple without any children or a single mom with one child. Mm-hmm. Um, in Sapporo, for the same sort of yield, we can actually get bigger properties uh, that might be family-sized. Right. And then family tenants yep. uh, tend to stay a lot longer than couples or single. Right, right. So yep. it's a more well, stable... Can that yeah, I mean, so it's a more stable, it's a lot slower, the mentality there. Um, but it's also, when you do have a vacancy or when something does break down, it can be longer and it can cost more. Okay, okay, that's good to know. So, okay, so coming back, when we talk about loans, how, 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 what should we position, how do we position ourselves if we were looking to get something that has loan or we should start just small first and see how it goes? Well, the loan criteria, I mean, first of all, let's discuss loans for people like yourselves who are non-residents and don't have any presence in Japan and so forth. Mm -hmm. So for you guys in your current situation, a loan would have to be um, either in Tokyo or Kanagawa, Osaka, uh, Kyoto, and Places like Nagoya or Fukuoka is subject to approval, so depending on whether the bank will approve it or not. Right. Um, you have to set up a... Do, do you happen to have Hong Kong residency? No, we don't have Hong Kong residency. Okay, so then you'll have to we set up... Do. You'll have to set up... You'll have to go for a Japanese lender, which means you'll have to set up a Japanese company structure. Uh-huh, okay. And that costs about three or $4,000 to set up. Okay. The uh, mortgage broker charges, um, these costs are all only payable if the loan is uh, approved in principle. So you don't have to pay anything beforehand and then you can pay that from the loan right. amount from the loan amount that you receive. So it's not out of pocket, but it does need to be paid when the loan is approved. Right. And then the mortgage broker charges, I think $2,000 to set up the loan or $1,500 to $2,000 US to set up the loan. And the okay. bank the bank charges a two percent setup cost. Okay. And then the bank setup cost is about two percent. Okay. Yeah, and then they'll only again they'll only approve loans for those particular locations. They'll want buildings that will have not been beyond twenty five years at loan maturity. So you have to aim for younger buildings. Right. So young, yeah, not more than twenty. When they when the when Loan matures, okay. More, not idea. beyond 25 years, yeah. Okay. And the other thing is, uh, it's got to be purely residential. So if, you've, if you're purchasing properties that have got um, any short-term rentals or commercial rentals or even monthly leases as opposed to long-term leases, um, the bank will not improve the loan until all of the tenants, uh, all of the tenants in the property are on long-term residential leases. Understand. And the last thing is, is that if you're purchasing in Fukuoka and potentially in Nagoya as well, the bank will force you to use their designated property managers, which tend to cost a little bit more because it's some of the bigger companies that are nationwide. So they tend to cost a little bit more than the local property managers that, for example, we would normally appoint. And also, if right. you're unhappy with the property manager for any reason, you might be able to replace them, but only with another designated one that the bank appoints. I understand. Yep. And then the LTV ratio is up to 70 or 75% from memory. So you have to put in uh, right. 25 or 30% in cash. Right. And the interest is okay. somewhere between 3.2 to 4%, depending on the loan and the lender. Okay, 
So the loan interest is also higher, 3.2 to 4%. Well, higher okay. compared to a, a Japanese entity which has been established and generating income for a while. Understand. So the other thing yeah. that a lot of people... So does it... Sorry, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, why, why don't you complete what you want to say? The other thing... Well, the other thing that some people do is they, they first purchase some uh, properties in cash and they generate a local Japanese income for, say, five or six years. Right. Or they set up a company regardless. Then go for this. Yeah, they set up a company regardless of the loan and they set up, for example, um, an asset management company and they buy one building and put it under the company name. So the building is the asset manager for that building. The company is the asset manager for that building. And then after they've uh, established uh, five or six or seven years of income, then they're a normal Japanese entity and they can apply for any Japanese bank for a loan, which is, you know, the criteria becomes a lot easier. Understand, understand. Okay, but what, what's, the, what's the catch when you have it as a Japanese company structure? So you pay Japanese tax, right, basically? Well, you always Compared pay Japanese tax. Of... You always pay Japanese tax now. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can't, so... so, wait, so... Singapore and Japan have got a tax treaty in place, and that means that you'll first get taxed in Japan, and then any difference in the tax rates, you'll have to pay back home. Right. So you're not going to be paying double the taxes. With Japanese, um, with Japanese companies, if you're looking at assets that are about a million or over that, then the corporate tax is actually lower than individual tax. But up until that point, corporate tax is capped. So... Tax-wise, it does make more sense for the t budget that you were discussing so far, hundred or $200,000. Tax-wise, it does make mm -hmm. more sense to purchase as individuals. Right. And also company... So for, for companies, more one, uh, um, one million and above, then it's... Worth well, that's well, when, that's when the individual tax will go over 20 or 30% from memory, which is when it, uh, oh, it makes sense to, to cap it at the 20, 30%, the corporate tax that you get. Um, but the other thing is that accounting and bookkeeping cost a lot more for companies than they do for individuals as well. Right. So yeah. really the only reason for you to set up a company is um, one of two reasons. One is if you think that you're going to uh, be looking at total assets worth, say, a million US or more, then it does make yeah. sense tax-wise, or if you need the company structures because you're applying for a loan or for a visa or something of that sort. Right, right. For loan or visa, okay. Even though it's more costly, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it'll definitely cost more. And there's also, I mean, to set up the company structure itself costs about, I'd say at a minimum, probably $4,000. Yeah, understand. Okay, okay. good. We've got, a, I think we covered lot of things it give us some idea so the next question is how how do we how do we start or yeah how do we go from here yeah uh, well I guess the first thing is we're probably going to um, just exchange a few emails so we can set down criteria more clearly and we know exactly what we're looking for and then right. we'll send you um, engagement forms, which uh, you'll need to sign and have witnessed uh, by a notary public or a lawyer or a chartered accountant or somebody with like an official looking stamp, which is what they like to see here in Japan. Okay. And then that enables us to contact uh, realtors and sellers, uh, etc. on your behalf and represent you here. Um, and then if you actually want to start submitting offers on any particular property, we need our fee estimate paid in advance based on your budget. Mm -hmm. And then post-settlement will credit or debit you according to what the actual purchase price ended up being. And that fee estimate represents you until you settle. So you can submit, you know, 100 offers. We're not going to charge you anything extra for that. So it's uh, one fee estimate per one settlement. Okay. Um, coming back. What about bank account, for example, we have, if we are not going for the company structure and we're going for the sing, single ownership structure or individual structure, um, do we need to set up a bank there or, you know, how do, how do money get transferred back or something um, like that? It would be good if you could, but unfortunately that's not an option for non-residents. 
Okay. Um, I mean, some of the international banks offer what they call foreign investor accounts or foreign uh, or non-resident accounts, but these are not really practical for these uh, lower rental incomes because they charge you about fifty dollars per transaction or something, and they'll always right. want you. They'll always want you to keep worth of money in the account for them to be able to. So, well, for the same monthly fee that we charge for managing the portfolio, we also include financial management. So we collect the rental income, we do a, a periodical income and expenses statement. And then whenever you want to remit funds back home, you just let us know and we send them to you. Right. Okay. So when we buy through you, you could also help us manage the property? Yes, of course. Okay. Okay. So, so you would... I mean, after this email, if you could put that down so that we know the charges. I know we've got to pay you, you know, to buy and then uh, as our age, as our uh, representative and then, yep, yeah, and then as a management, how, how much is the fee so that, you know, we've got all this thing. Yeah, so I'll send you a document um, that we call explanation of services and that includes all of those fees. Um, right. th that applies for standard long-term leases. If you're going to end up doing monthly leases, it changes a little bit. Um, but, but, I mean, we'll get to that if you need to do that. Um, but just to give you a rough idea, so we're an added layer on top of realtors and property managers. So we work with the real estate agents and we work with the property management companies and we uh, interact with the building management companies and the insurance companies and all of that. So we're like your um, single point of contact or portfolio manager after the purchase. Right. And then our fees are, um, well, depending on your budget uh, per property, somewhere between 3 to 5%, uh, depending on the property price. And okay. for, for the monthly management, it's between 2 to 3%, again, depending on the price of the property. Okay. Um, but we like to think, and you can talk to some of our customers to confirm that, that we justify that cost not just by giving you the management, but we can also negotiate better prices. We can also work with agents that we know and provide full disclosure on every property and we also provide constant advice to help you just not to make any costly mistakes so I, I think you'll find that those fees more than cover themselves okay so just um, let me clarify for your service to help us um, negotiate and buy the property is about three to three and a half percent of the property price between and on top of that the do we still have to pay the agent yeah. The buying agent. Yeah, so oh, oh, that's the fee. The yeah. total cost breakdown is like that. So depending on the property price, again, if you're buying very cheap properties, like let's say a, an older studio unit that's costing uh, say thirty or forty thousand US, um, right. then the realtor fee is going to be closer to four and a half, five percent. Okay. Our fee as well will be about five percent. Right. Um, and then there's a purchase tax, which varies depending on the official evaluation, but it's probably safe to assume about 2.5%. Right. And legal and registration costs, which are, again, um, depending on official evaluation, and they're lower when the property is more expensive, but could be anywhere from 3 to 8%. Okay. So for very cheap properties um, that are valued very highly because prices have gone down in that particular location, for example, it could be closer to 8%. And, you know, properties that are pricier and the official eval still hasn't caught up because the market, like uh, Fukuoka, for example, for two or three years were evaluated a lot lower than it actually was market price-wise. So those kinds of places, it might be closer to 3%. So, again, it depends on the property and the official evaluation. I understand. When we send you Excel sheets to uh, analyze deals and try to uh, ascertain whether you're happy with the numbers or not, we always assume a worst-case scenario for purchase costs and running costs. So worst case, we like to assume 20% purchase costs. Usually by settlement, depending on the price of the property, it's going to be anywhere from 12 to 17% purchase cost. Right. But we, we just like to look at a worst case scenario so that by settlement, it can only improve. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so at least we factor in about 20% worst case scenario for the the purchase costs for the cheaper sentence. properties i mean if if we're going to be yep. aiming for anything that's say over 5 million yen to begin with like properties that cost um 45,000 us and upwards mm -hmm. per unit then it's probably going to be more like 18% worst case so we'll adjust that depending on the property we're looking at understand okay but really we can get something for 30,000 
US dollars. Yeah, absolutely. Not um, yeah. probably, def- I mean, definitely not in Tokyo and Osaka. Yeah, uh, and it's get hard, getting harder in Nagoya and Fukuoka as well. But in other places, that's still, I mean, Sapporo, Kumamoto, um, sometimes in, on the outskirts of Kobe, that's still very doable. It's just that's why I'm saying that you we never we never realize that you can do that. It's like you know, it's it's like the price of a car, really. Yeah, I know the market's gone through um, two decades of deflation here. So. Understand. There Understand. are still very cheap places, and definitely compared to Singapore. Mm. Um, but again, I mean, nicer places, more central locations, higher prices, lower yields, but it's worth it because it's much more stable tenancies, and obviously the less. The, the newer the place is, the less maintenance you're going to pay. So, I mean, it's just a matter yeah, of striking yeah, yeah. Strike a balance that's right for you, that's all. Mm, okay, sounds good. Okay, so anything else that I need to know or, you know, then before you send me your thing and I, I could get back to you. But like I say, I'm traveling, you know, I, I probably couldn't get back to any documents to sign and all that, probably... End of next week. I'm only back to Singapore uh, 2nd of December. No, that's fine. Take your time. There's no rush from our side. I guess anything else that you need to know? Um, well, not generally. I mean, we'll, we'll talk a lot about specific locations and specific property profiles when we start looking at individual deals. But generally, I think that's probably about it. Okay. 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 I think we covered up. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Our you so pleasure. much, Zeth. I'll send you those yeah. documents and uh, the explanation of services. Just have a read of that. That might bring up some more questions that you might want to ask. Okay. Yeah, All right. We'll speak soon again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks thank you. again. Have a good day. Take care. Bye. Bye. You too. So there you have it. Again, nothing we have not discussed here in the past, but it is good to put these things into context and see how they can affect performance of investment portfolios over time. And also, like in the case of, say, a finance purchase versus a cash purchase, cash purchase or a property designated for monthly rentals as well as potential long-term leases, some of these decisions that we'll be making will also dictate the property profile that we'll be aiming for in the first place, whether it's the location, the size, the age, or even the layout of the property. And all of that, of course, also dictates the purchase budget. And vice versa, if we know we have a maximum budget or a minimum yield ceiling, That will, by default, then dictate our strategy accordingly because we'll only be able to aim for particular property profiles that may or may not be applicable with one one or more particular strategies. So that's it from us for today, folks. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. As always, do feel free to leave your comments, your questions, or requests for more information or more episodes of a particular type in the comments section of wherever you might have found this episode. If you haven't done so yet, we'd really appreciate it if you could share this podcast with your network. And even better, if you could leave us a star rating or even a short review in the iTunes store, the Spotify app, or anywhere that good podcasts can be found and rated. Your opinion not only matters to us, but it also helps us reach more listeners who may benefit from this content, which is, of course, a win-win situation for everyone involved. We hope to have you with us next time, so do subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so already. And until then, from all of us here at NTI... We wish you a fantastic week or weekend, day or night, wherever in the world you may be tuning in from and whichever time you happen to be listening to us at. And until we meet again, happy home hunting.